Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is James Holland. I'm, as already mentioned, I'm head of AppSec for City. Um, my colleague oh, uh, from Control Plane will be joining us shortly. There's no rush at the moment. He's going to come in and give us a demonstration of what we're doing at the moment. Um, so, a bit of a provocative title. Uh, how is your supply chain with your insecure OSS ingestion? Um, so we'll try and take you through what we're going to go on that. So I'll try and give you a bit of an overview of the landscape. I'm not going to go into supply chain details. There's a lot more bright people in the room than me who know a lot more about this than I do. So I'm going to leave that to them. But I'll s try and say where we think the landscape is going. OK. Um, I'll give you a background of the why. A um, bit of a history of what I've been doing over the 20 years in supply chain with people like Department of Defense, which is super interesting. Um, some of the toolings we've seen in the past and what we're hoping to open source to the community with, the, with Control Plane and uh, City, okay? And then wrap up. So this is how we are looking at the landscape um, from uh, the work we're doing in, in the marketplace. Um, We've got a, in City, we've got quite an extensive uh, software supply chain program under John Meadows. He heads up a few of the working groups and in the working groups for CNCF supply chain, um, also the OSSF as well. Um, but before I do I get into this, can I have a show of hands? Who here is using a package manager or something like Artifactory in their organizations? Yeah, okay. And do you ingest software directly into your pipelines straight off GitHub? Some nervous looking people, yeah? Hands up. Anybody else doing some of straight into your pipelines without checking where it's coming from or whether you should use it or not? Uh, and, and another show of hands. How many people are actually doing an assessment of whether you should be using that library or not? One. Excellent. I'll come and speak to you later. Okay, so I think that's what I'm trying to emphasize is that the point is that you can use this library, but should you? Is it fit for purpose? Is it what it's saying is doing is the right thing? Okay, now, as you can see in this landscape here, you can't have a supply chain, secure bills, if you have no idea where you're getting your libraries from and you don't know the maturity levels and all the other signals that might go around that, okay? If we uh, look at this tweet, I think this sums up the problem pretty well, actually. Look at all these package managers, you know, very flexible, super helpful, but a lot of them allow to run pre and post install scripts as soon as you've installed it, the piece of software into your development environment. Now. We know from previous experience, NPM has got 2.2% of all the libraries have scripts that run. And then, if we look in further, we've done some analysts and analyzed some of these. 94% of them, you say, are pretty insecure or malicious. It's quite a huge amount. So if you look at the NPM alone, 2% of the libraries there are doing malicious activities. Now, that's not great, especially as you've got no way of checking that at installation time, at the present moment in time, okay? So you might have software that does things, and there is some commercial software that does this, okay? But there's nothing really out there for anybody else, okay? Um, and thanks to Avni, you give me permission to show this. Um, so if we start looking at what signals we want to look at, there's never green yes, yeah, yes or no. There's always a gray area in between. So we're always going to take libraries from Google, Assured Open Source, or Alpha Amiga project from uh, OpenSSF, because they've gone through a whole series of checks, and we can rely on them. Um, and you know, that's the level of trust we have with those organizations. But you still have to ingest them, and you still have to then check the signatures that came from the, that source. Okay? And then there's the ones you can deny. You know, we're having a signal that we know this library is being worked on by somebody who has a so, sort of 
dodgy background, or you know it's coming from a sanctioned country. We, we've seen this in the bank, okay? Um, the fact the package doesn't have a signature is not a necessarily a bad sign, but if a signature is failing, it would suggest it is. Um, um, I'm not gonna go on to malicious code. I think that's where the install scripts, I was saying the P and post install scripts on the package managers comes into this red area. And as a bank, you've got to make, try and make a decision, or organization enterprise, you've got to try and make a decision. But then you get all the gray area. Should any one of those fail, should you block the usage of that library? No. It's up to each individual, individual enterprise to make a risk decision based off this information and have their own policies around this. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of information in there, a lot of signals coming in that we see and a lot of different feeds coming in. Okay, so we need a way of having a, right now, a very simple policy for uh, enterprises to check these signals and make a decision whether they should ingest this library or not. Okay. Um, and then you're gonna have to start scaling this up. If you're making a decision around this, it's, it's okay to do it for one or two libraries or 50 libraries but what if you're starting to deal with three million libraries? And you have to then do it continuously. So it needs a bit of scale around this. Okay. Um, so, as I said before, I've got a bit of history about this. Um, uh, I've done this for manually for a long time. Department of Defense, we used to do this. They wanted everything built from source, and if you brought a library in, you, you had to justify its existence every single time. So you were very careful on what its maturity of it was, so we didn't have to replace it. So just looking, this is a spreadsheet that we, my colleague, Francois Goemarsh, used to come up with, and we used to use this every time. So any developer used to come in and ask for a library, they had to go through this checklist, and then we go, like an empire, emperor, thumbs up or a thumbs down. And that's including, that was including Oracle Database. So we had to build Oracle Database from source for DOD and put it to escrow, uh, which was quite um, interesting. So what I would like to say about this is that <laughs> the process of building everything from source is not possible for most people. Okay, there's only certain organizations of a certain scale can do that. Google do it for their Borg. DOD demand it of a lot of organizations. But trying to do a reproducible build or build your source code is impossible because all of the environments are so different on all the install scripts. Each, each library requires something else to be done to, for the build to happen. Um, so it's, it's too difficult to do and too expensive to do. Okay. Uh, what else? So, I think we mentioned this before. I think the previous speaker mentioned this. So, there's a load of new tooling coming in. This is allowing us to automate a lot of this. So, S bombs, SASA, attestations. That would be great if we could get that every time. Um, Vex, uh, as I mentioned. There's also Kev, another one, which is known exploitable vulnerabilities. That's an interesting one to look at. So you can say, actually, there is a proper exploit here. Um, but these are now, are now allowing us to automate and scale this automatically. Um, and that's what we're hopefully trying to do. But the tools do exist. They have evolved a little bit. We have scorecards and stuff like that. Um, but they're limited to normally proprietary systems. So you have a lot of the vendors do have the intelligence, but they don't actually allow you to make a decision on the gray area. They'll just say yes, no, and that's it. You might want to do some further investigation and actually make some policy decisions around that. Okay. Um, so there's limited availability for uh, the tool, the current tooling we have to remove this toil. So, we're trying to, we've been working together with Control Plane at City to come up with a tool to uh, allow us to ingest software. 
to make the checks beforehand um, and allow it to be groomed um, uh, and remove uh, a lot of the problems of toil, as I mentioned before. And then obviously using the best practices you're seeing around in Salsa and a few other the uh, Fres uh, Fresno areas about signing and putting, making sure we bring those in the correct way. Okay. Some of the use cases, uh, I'm going to just quick on to that. Um, some of the use cases around this are getting a bit more complicated. So at the moment, we're focusing on the blue areas, the top right, about how we're ingesting the libraries in. But we're doing a bit of a separation of the policy of what you ingest in and, and actually what the scanning policy might be or the test policy you do. Um, so when we collect the evidence, we don't make a decision within the container at that time. We collect the evidence and store it for later. We sign it and store it for later and then make a policy decision at the end because that allow us then to rerun that in the future, the next day or the day after the day after. So if we collected the evidence, we can then, the policy changes, we can then see it, we re reevaluate it. Um, and this allows us to groom the libraries daily. Uh, <coughs> what do I also want to say about this? Um, I think it's very interesting to separate what the initial lookup is from the scan policy, because initial lookup policy of a PRL can do this particular scan or not, or it can be coming in a particular way is okay. But the scan policy can have a massive effect across all the scans and all the, all the libraries you're using. So if I change the policy on whether a signature is allowed or not, I want to see what that effect is if I make that change across the organization. If I've got three million libraries in and I say everything must be signed, you could lose 50% of your libraries from your organization. So you need to test and show what the effect would be on that scan policy change. Okay. Um, and also, we want to be able to subscribe to feeds so we can bring these in earlier. And I think that's the red section, top left. But individual libraries, you've got to be able to give an override as well. We see this a lot, that there's stuff that's brought in that fails the policy a very specific policy, which Thomas will demonstrate later, that you actually you say, for this library, it's going to be fine, no problem at all. You're going to let that in, because we know we've done some backward tracks to allow it, because it, even though you have a core policy set you've set up, it's going to blow, it, blow you away at the water with the, the failure. OK. Um, some flows, and I'm going to try and go a bit quicker so we can get more demo in. Um, as I said, uh, there's a separation between PURL, package URL. There's our universal lookup. Um, we make a policy decision there. We can get feeds to make an instant decision or yes or no. Um, but then we can go into different flows. The first is the Intel flow. You know, going for scorecards or uh, chain guard uh, cards or other feeds from other vendors. Um, Within the city, we've got about four or five different feeds that we use, giving us various information about even individual developers. Um, so then most things will go through the standard flow, uh, but you also think they might go on to things like, okay, this is a package, NPM. Do we want to actually run this in a sandbox? See what it does on the install scripts run it in the, over a period of time with a uh, Linux timestamp so we can see what is going to happen over a two or three week period and accelerate that to see what it does. Because it might actually have, yeah, have some sleeper code in it that gets triggered in two weeks time. So that's the th sort of uh, extensions we're, we're looking to put into this. Okay. And also getting from alternative sources, I think I've mentioned that here, I think that's um, I've mentioned that in the first slide. So, without further ado, I'm going to. A lot of talking. It's a very similar uh, talk that we gave in Dublin. Um, but this time, we want to give a demo of what we're doing. We're in early alpha, but we'd like a bit of feedback off that if we could. So, I'll uh, ask Thomas to come up. Oops. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay.
Um, let me kick off with an example. Um, so uh, we are going to demo the NPM uh, ecosystem today. And um, React, everyone knows it, I guess. And yeah, so if someone requests React, um, we always care also about the um, dependencies. And in this one, the direct one, we have loose Enrify and a transitive one with JS tokens um, that we also need to ingest, that we also need to um, check. So we've built um, open source ingestion based on um, AWS, EKS, and uh, Tecton. And so we have Tecton pipelines in place. And yeah, let's just kick it off. Those are the two PLs I'm going to send off. So one is the mentioned React example. And the other one is the um, uh, shell quote package, uh, more to that later why. And this is just a test script to send it to our API. And I send it off. And right now, the um, Tecton dashboard is a good way to uh, showcase what's going on. And I, um, we can see we have uh, four pipeline runs running. The reason of that is the first one is React. Then we have two sub-dependencies for React. And then we have the shellcode package. Um, so this one is going to be React running our different checks. and. We're almost halfway through here already. Um, and let's go a bit more deeper into the checks we are running at the moment. And this is something that can expand quite a lot, right? Like in the future, we can, we are going to have the um, pre and post install script uh, checks uh, in a different task and um, SAS checks, etc. All of all kinds of things we can run here. So right now we have in the first stage the Intel scorecard check. Uh, the, the scorecard check itself. So we're going to look at the GitHub repository um, of that um, dependency. Signature check. Um, lots of signatures everywhere nowadays, but um, no point in if you don't verify them. We are doing that here. Um, most package managers or um, registries publish or, or supply um, the, the signatures. And we are checking the signature here against the public key that is public key available. And um, at the first stage, we are running our vulnerability stage. So we are doing um, running, calling out to sneak here and, call, and checking if there are any vulnerabilities, any CVEs, stuff like that in here. And James mentioned before the policy. Um, let's go uh, inside the task on itself to see. So in the policy decision stage, we are fetching all the check results of the previous stages. We're getting them back. And we run um, a policy check against OPA um, with a, a bit of policy we've written. And in this case, a bit of a spoiler here, um, it's a pass. So uh, policy, uh, policy passed. And that means we can um, continue with ingestion and um, can put it in our internal libraries. Now, the last one, shell quote. One second here. Um, I got a kind of a bit of a different message here. Um, first, I got a message from scorecard. Branch protection is not so great. Many GitHub repositories um, have that. So um, it could be a warning. It could be a failure, depending on your policy. So that's, that's quite flexible. But here, in here, we also have a high CVE coming uh, back from Snook. And um, there's a remote code execution CVE. And you probably don't want that um, to be ingested. So in terms of um, ingestion, what does that mean? Um, so we have, let's go in here. We have an EJ st stage. We do a couple things here. So depending on the previous policy decision, we go different paths. So we can go um, to the internal registry, and um, if it, everything passed and we, we are golden, we can throw it to um, quarantine, or we can straight up deny things um, or emit warnings. And at the same time, um, not only putting it out to registries, but um, also making um, sure that everyone knows about it. That's, that's another important thing to notify people. So right now, um, simple uh, emails we are sending out to SNS. And here I can see 
what happened um, inside um, our uh, tecton um, in summary. So um, shellcode, we already know why it failed. Let's look into JS tokens. And here fails the signature check. Um, reason being of that signature check is because um, uh, NPM does not enforce um, you to put signatures on your packages. In Maven, that is mandatory, for example. Um, so if a signature check fails in the Maven system, it gets much more interesting because then something is really going wrong. Um, but in NPM, um, it's not mandatory. And if it's not there, we can't run a signature check. And therefore, it fails for us. In terms of eGest, um, right now, we are putting it into an S3 bucket that is kind of like our output store. And you can see here, we have the two packages that um, both got accepted along with the signature um, for further consumption. If someone else wants to run signature checks again, they can use that. Um, but our two um, failed packages, of course, are not, um, are not part of that gang in here uh, because we didn't allow them. Um, there's a bit more going on. So in terms of check results um, and provenance, we, we are using Tecton chains to create um, provenance for us. So we are signing that with our KMS key and um, putting in a DynoDB for all of our provenance. But um, the provenance doesn't capture the actual result of the checks for us. So for example, um, the scorecard check, uh, JSON I get back, is not part of the pro provenance by Tecton chains but we still very much care about those results and we still want to fetch them back. Which is why we've written um, a small database client. Um, it's no, um, noise curl, so we have a, a document on MongoDB running here. And let's go into, is that readable? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have a bunch of information in here, and there's going to be more in the future, but all of that is metadata that we can use to reference data with each other, to reference what other checks have been running, um, and uh, time of ingestion, stuff like that, to uh, also trigger re-ingests, uh, things like that. But we also have a payload, and signature check is kind of easy right now. We have either it passed or it failed. So here we have our current example, React. That one passed, and so we have signature verified true. Um, but we are outside of Tecton Chains, and so with Tecton Chains, what it gives us, we can verify our provenance, but we also want to be able to verify our provenance um, from our check results, which is why we have written um, with uh, DSSE envelopes um, a mechanism to also verify these documents. So that signature is. Um, uh, part of that, and as, so anytime we pull back those check results, we can always verify the signature of everything and can make sure that someone else didn't do something like this, or, you know, like, um, mess with our check results to get something through, so we can always um, do that. Yeah. That is pretty much it for a technical demo, there's a bit more to it, but um, that's all we have time for now, and I think um, it's also a good time to have questions, if there are any. We have a version. Um, those here, the PLs. Um, the, the, the UI where in um, Tektron. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, the you, you had a screen you drilled down. You had the, the packet information. I think you just like two minutes ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, your check didn't look like it had a version. It's like you had an NPM check for a signature. And that check, you, are you versioning your checks or no? Um, yes, kind of, because um, the check itself is versioned because it's unique in, in the context of Tecton chains as well. 
Um, we have the task run ID in our context with the database to make it unique. And in terms of the versioning of the database, we also have we have that context. Um, with our versioning of the actual code we're running inside those checks, um, those are at the end of the day um, as Docker images um, that we can version accordingly. And, um, and that, that information is also part of Tecton Chain. So someone could go back and check at what version was this check running. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're, uh, you, the example you had was you, someone went in and edited it, made it super good, mm. uh, but the, the check itself, it didn't look like you had enough information on the check. You had a timestamp, and you had the yeah. name of the check, but you didn't have the version of it. So that could itself be. That, that could, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, you can follow it on that, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Thank you.